you, if we broke attendance records, I'd get the church logo tattooed on my arm. Skip, remember back when we first started? All we did was preach the gospel. Ooh, Superman works. I like Superman. Guy, what do you think? What happened to you? Me? Your dad is the one with the gimmicks. The power of the Holy Spirit propels us. I just want the church to get back to the gospel. Problem is you're trying to get your message across. Uh, the gospel? Right, right, right. And ain't nobody listening to that. For Good Friday and Easter, I need something big. Amen? Bigger than the resurrection. Bigger than anything we've ever done. National headlines. Preach on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Play it. An actual crucifixion. Uh -oh. By placing the nails through your palms in the right place, we hope to avoid major nerve damage. Operation stop, skip as a go. That's awesome. You have to cancel this Good Friday stunt. Don't be so dramatic, honey. Ooh, I like the rusty ones. What are you gonna do? I told him he's insane. I've been praying for you about that toe fungus. This could be beneficial for all parties involved. We foster a yes environment here. <laughs> God wanted me to marry you and you could be my wife. I have an answer for you. <laughs>
face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the
special this morning, uh, Via Dolorosa on the piano and organ. Um, let this song, let it prepare our hearts for prayer.
Father, when we consider all that your son would endure during this week 2,000 years ago, from a triumphal entry to the purging of your temple, to the teachings of last things, to that moment when he would be arrested in the place of prayer, where he would be beaten, where he would be mocked, where he would travel down that way of suffering, the Via Dolorosa, to the place of the skull. When we think of all that he gave for us, it leaves us, Lord, without words. Unable to express our gratitude. Unable to find words to express how deeply grateful we are. But because of all that Jesus did, today we are a people who have life in that more abundantly. And for that, Father, we praise you today. We thank you, God, for the gift of your love, for the wonderful mercy and grace that you've bestowed, for the hope that is ours in Jesus. And this morning, as we come boldly into your presence, we come asking God that you would hear our praise asking God that you would receive our hearts, asking God that you would care for us at the point of every one of our needs. Lord, today we just want to say thank you and we want to say we trust you and we lean into you asking God that you would minister to us now according to the riches of your glory by Christ Jesus. That today we could rest in confidence that every need that we have will be supplied, that we can trust knowing God that every request we make, you'll hear and you'll respond to. That today we can give you glory because you are so incredibly good to us. May we be found faithful, Lord, living the life that you've called us to. And on this Sunday morning, may you know that our hearts are turned completely towards you in love, in worship, in faithfulness. Hear our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue on in worship, we remember that it's been about a year since our world got turned upside down, amen? And it has affected each one of us differently. There has been loss of life. There have been loss of jobs. But over and abundantly clear is that God is still in control, amen? So as you stand and join us, let's remember that the battle belongs to him. He's already fought it and he's already won it. So we need to stop trying to fight it ourselves. Amen? (laughs) We need to remember that why should we fight this again? He's already won.
shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Amen? Amen Amen, amen You may be seated Pastor John, come share with us People always ask me what it was like when I was dead. I think the better question is, how am I alive? The answer starts with this man named Jesus. The day I died, he told my father, don't worry, just believe. My father, a city leader, a well-respected man was, he was crying begging at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says, just believe. Believe. Jesus started to come help. Then he got distracted by someone. And when he finally did arrive at our house, he told all the mourners I was just sleeping. Not dead. Sleeping. They laughed at him. Everyone in the room laughed. Not everyone. My father, he believed that day. He believed Jesus. You see, before it all happened, I called him father. But after that day, I called him daddy. I found out what he was willing to do to have me back. What he was willing to give up to save me. My daddy threw off everything he was. A ruler, a proud man, an important member of society. To fall at the feet of the last hope for his little girl. My daddy. He would tell you that Jesus, too, threw off all he was, everything that belonged to him, and died like a criminal for our sakes. So that all of us could be brought back to life. That's how I am alive. It is the most incredible truth in history that Jesus threw off everything that he was, everything that he had. That we might have life. This morning, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, I want us to look there in the fifth chapter, a number of verses. I'm going to read the whole story this morning because I want you to hear it and let it begin to sink in as we look to the word of the Lord today. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, actually, where it says, when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, he'd been over on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, where he ministered to those in the Gadarenes, and he now had returned to the western shore, to the, the shore immediately adjacent to the city of Capernaum. And it says, when he gathered there, a great multitude gathered about him, and he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and upon seeing him, fell at his feet. And he entreated him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. This was no small thing. This man was the 
synagogue official. He was in charge of the synagogue. He was the leader in the community. He was in a position where doing what he did, falling at the feet of Jesus, could put everything that he knew and had grown accustomed to at risk. Jesus, hearing his words, verse 24, went off with him. And a great multitude was following him and pressing in on him. And a woman, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse, after hearing about Jesus, came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. She thought, if I just touch his garments, I shall get well. And when she did, immediately the flow of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And immediately Jesus, perceiving that power had proceeded from him and gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, You see the multitude pressing in on you and you ask, Who touched me? But looking around, he saw the woman. And the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened in her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of Jairus saying, Jairus, your daughter has died. Don't trouble the teacher teacher anymore. But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to Jairus, Jairus, don't be afraid any longer. Just believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. And they came to the house of Jairus, and he he beheld a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing and entering in. He said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child's not died. She's simply sleeping. They all but laughed him out of the house. But putting them all out, Jesus took the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately she arose, began to walk and... This one was 12 years old. And immediately, they were all astounded. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone about it. And then he added, get her something to eat. Kind of a neat way to end the story. Uh, this, this, this really is an incredible story within a story. As you begin to think about all that's happened and all that I've shared, I want you to grab with me a couple of truths. I, in fact, I'd love to have you write them down because they're the kind of things that I think we just need to have stick with us. The first one's this, Jesus never let a need an opportunity pass him by. Everywhere he went, every place he was, every need he encountered, he addressed and ministered to. And then right on the heels of that, Jesus calls each one of us to believe. To just believe. 
I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know the kind of things that you have been encountering. And over these five weeks that we've been talking about this theme of just believing, the one thing that is that has struck me that the Lord keeps coming back to me with is, John, there are places in your life where if you would just believe, you could overcome this, you could conquer that. This would finally turn around and become what I want it to be. But you've got to believe. And the one thing that I've recognized is that so many of us live our lives in this place where we are are prisoners of our own fears. Prisoners of our own inability to just believe. And Jesus speaks to all of us this morning in verse 36 when he says, Do not be afraid any longer. Just believe. The New American Standard puts it this way, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. Don't try to do something else. Don't try to find another way. Don't try to figure out what else you could add to it. Just only believe. It's all it takes. And you'll find victory. Our story this morning has in it three characters. Let's talk about them for just a moment. Jairus is called a synagogue official, the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. He was a Jewish elder with incredible power, incredible might, who, who, who was basically in charge of the people and what they did and how they lived and the places they went and the things they were a part of. He, he basically ran the show. His pursuit of Jesus and his falling at Jesus' feet is something that would be totally out of character for a man like him. In in fact, to do this in the eyes of his fellow Jews was a big no-no. Jesus was this upstart. He was wreaking havoc in the world. His message was counter-revolutionary to to what they had been teaching and they had been believing. And, and, And for Jairus to set all of that aside and see Jesus as the only hope, well, well it's, it's a huge thing. He no doubt had heard the stories. Word had gotten to him that this man had incredible power and could do absolutely unbelievable things. And he wondered... Could he help my little girl, my princess, the most important thing in my life? And falling at the feet of Jesus, he begs for her healing. Next, we meet an unnamed woman. She uh, had struggled with a bleeding disorder for 12 years. The word says she had endured much at the hands of many physicians. She'd spent everything that she had, but things were only getting worse. Because of her condition, she was an outcast. She had no place in society. She was unclean. Her entrance into the crowd, an absolute no-no in her culture. And yet she came just believing that Jesus could make the difference. And then there's this, in this story a, a picture of a little girl. We know not much about her. We we, we do know she's sick. We do know in the story, the family comes and says to Jairus, your little girl has died. 
And we do know that she's 12 years old. I was sharing with Pastor John this morning that that there's just this part that jumps off the page to, uh, at me this week, and I've never really been able to reconcile it, and I've read about it, and everybody talks about it, but nobody seems to be able to figure it out. But, but we've just talked about an unnamed woman who's suffered for 12 years. And now we have a little girl, 12 years of age, who's got a situation that she can do nothing about. And she dies. What is most interesting to me in this whole story is the fact that Jesus met each one of them right where they were. He cared for them at the point of their need And he rewarded their belief in him with a miracle that forever changed their lives. There's those two truths again. Jesus never let a need, an opportunity, pass him by. And Jesus calls each of us to just believe. That's it. Let's take a little deeper look at the story. We begin with what I call first steps towards a miracle. Jesus, or Jairus, believed in the possibilities that were presented to him by Jesus. Uh, Up to this point in the journey, he'd, he'd only heard about him. He had, he had heard all the things that he had done. There was this record, this transcript of, of his miracles and his teachings. And, and Jairus must have known by his actions that, that this Jesus was someone who, who, who might just be able to make the difference. He believed in the possibilities presented by Jesus. And that leads him on a faith journey to do something that that risked his standing, that risked his position, that risked everything that he was and had because in coming to Jesus, the elders that served with him certainly would look down on him and wonder what had happened to this man. But he comes and he bows at Jesus' feet. And he asks for a miracle. Haven't we all at some point been there? Where we didn't know what to do. There didn't seem to be any answers available to us. So we come to Jesus. But then we confront this little detour along the way. This woman who had suffered with a hemorrhage for 12 long years, a castaway, unclean, plagued with no one to help. She'd exhausted all the help that was available to her. She had exhausted all of her resources. She'd exhausted all of her hope. And all she had left was to believe in the possibilities presented by Jesus and making her way through the crowd. She reaches and touches the hem of his garment. She was healed. And she found a miracle that day. It's interesting that when Jesus looks at her and calls her out, he he looks at her and he says, your faith, your beliefs have made you well. That phrase made you well 
better translated from the Greek as your beliefs have saved or rescued you. Jesus is saying to her that her faith, her belief that if she just touched the hem of his garment would rescue her from this affliction. Or better yet, her belief would change her life forever. And it did. Which brings me to the third part of the story when Jesus speaks life into one who had died. This is huge. Mark chapter 5, 35, the word says that in the midst of Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood, uh, family members, someone comes from Jairus' home and gently taps him on the shoulder and says, your little girl has died. There's no need now to bother the teacher. But Jesus hears what's going on. You know, that's the one thing we forget, that God is all-knowing, that we can't hide anything from him. Oh, we think we can whisper this or whisper that, but he hears. He's all-present, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and, and he hears those words, and he looks at Jairus, and he says, Jairus, Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Just believe. Your little girl's been terribly sick. You've wondered what was going to happen to her. Your faith has brought you to my feet, begging for her life. And now you've heard she's died. Don't fear what you feared the most. Only believe. You remember we'd, we'd said of Jairus, that when he came to Jesus, he believed in the possibilities presented by him. And now it was time to make faith action. They come to the house and it's filled with mourners. It's kind of a weird phenomena. In that day, in, in that time in history, when somebody died, there was this group of mourners in the community. They were, they were professional criers who would come to the house and they would weep and they would well with you in a, in a way just to, to make it seem as though you had mourned appropriately. Kind of weird. And Jesus enters in and he calls it out. He says, what is all this commotion going on in here? And he looks at them and he says, you need to understand this little girl, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And translating the language from, from, from the Greek to the English as it was literally spoken, it says they laughed him or tried to laugh him out of the room. Who do you think you are? We know dead when we see dead. And she's dead. And Jesus says, no, she's sleeping. Now you all leave. And I want you to get that. Uh, there's something really significant there when it says that he, he puts them all out. He clears the room. You don't need doubters when a miracle's about to happen. 
And Jesus calls out to Peter, James, and John, his little sacred trio, and he says, guys, grab mom and dad and come with me. And they go into the little girl's bedroom, and there she is laid out. And Jesus does what you're never supposed to do if you're living under the law, and that is he, he touches a dead body. You see, in this story, Jesus had done two things terribly wrong. Number one, he had been touched by a woman with the issue of blood, which made him ceremonial unclean, and now he touches a dead body. But she isn't dead to him. And he says to her, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. And she sits up. She stands to her feet and she begins to move around the room and the miracles happen. Jesus spoke words of life over her and she arose fully alive. You know, he does the same thing to us. He speaks words of love and grace and mercy. He says, I forgive you. Come to me. And in that moment, there's this divine human transaction when we become fully alive. And there's those two truths again. Jesus never let a lead, an opportunity, pass him by. And this morning, he calls each and every one of us to just believe. It's an incredible passage. A story within a story. But what do we learn from it today? What have we learned in these five weeks as we've talked about the call to believe. Well, from Thomas, we learned that seeing is believing. And when he saw the the prints of the nails in Jesus' hand and the wound in his side, he, he fell at his feet and said, my Lord, my God, seeing is believing, but feeling is truth. And in that moment, Thomas was changed forevermore. From the centurion, we learned that regrets won't save you. He'd administered the death sentence of many. This time it was different. And as he watches and he listens and he sees all that transpires, he proclaims that surely this man was innocent. He is the son of God. Regrets won't save you, but Jesus can. From Pilate, we learned the answer to the question, what is truth? Jesus, just who are you? And Jesus simply speaks. Pilate washes his hands. Remember in the video it said, there's not enough water to wash. The guilt I feel in there. Truth is Jesus. For Mary and Martha, we learned that statement before I believed in him. Now, I believe him. There's a difference between believing in things. and believing Jesus. 
we can say all day long, I believe in him. But until we believe him, until we trust him with the most difficult and intimate fears and struggles in our lives, until we believe him, we don't really live. And something happened in their lives that day when they heard him say, Lazarus, come forth. And it was no longer about believing in. It was all about believing him. And then today, from this amazing story about Jairus and an unnamed woman and a little girl who died, we learn this truth. When we choose to believe, miracles happen. Now I'm going to be honest in telling you, sometimes those miracles take on a little bit different face than we were anticipating. Sometimes those miracles aren't exactly what we thought they could be. But when we believe, Miracles happen. Jairus found his faith rewarded. The woman found healing when no one else could help her. A little girl raises to new life just because daddy believed. And the story of Easter, Palm Sunday, the Lenten season, this whole incredible event is a story where miracles happen. And they just aren't tied to ancient history. They're present today too. In the life of a teen who I talked with yesterday who shared with me that he'd just found Jesus. Jesus. And to another seated with us when he said, yes, I'd like to ask Jesus into my heart. And we prayed and he did. The life of a football player, six foot five, 360 pounds, a monster no one would ever think would have fears. He said to me this way, Pastor John, I'm so thankful Jesus is always with me. Because if I didn't have him, I'd live in absolute fear. Catch that. In the life of a friend, of whom recently doctors said, We can't help you. You're going to die. But seven days later, was home. Healed. Fully alive. In the life of a marriage that no one gave hope for. Jesus brought healing. And they've enjoyed their life ever since. When we choose to believe, miracles happen. Do you believe that? More importantly, Do you live that? You see, there's there's difference between believing in the possibilities of miracles and believing miracles happen. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. 
Whatever the problem, whatever the circumstance, whatever the hurt, whatever the heartache, whatever the brokenness, whatever is wrong, just believe. Just believe. And let God do a miraculous, more than amazing absolutely unbelievable work in you. Because when we believe, miracles happen. Amen? Have an incredible day. Enjoy Sunday school. Come back to and we'll celebrate a great evening together. God bless you.